So the, the other thing that you can occasionally see in uh, images that you need to be aware of is the misregistration that can occur when you have flow that's oblique to the slice plane. And here, if we have flow in a vein that's oblique to the slice plane that we see, this is at the time of the 90 degree pulse. And at the 90 degree pulse, you can see that just the <coughs> a, a quadrilateral space area of spins are going to see the 90 degree pulse in the vein. By the time the 180 degree pulse comes along, that has shifted in space because of flow. And then when we get the spin echo, and if the read, if the read encoding gradient is up, to, uh, up and down, what we can see that it's only this small amount of blood right here in the center that sees both the 90 and 180 degree pulses. And by the time two tau comes around, that actually has displaced itself outside of the actual slice plane. But the computer still thinks it's in the slice plane. And when you do the readout gradient, uh, it will it will uh, it will indicate that it's actually moved up. So what it what the computer thinks is that this piece of uh, of nuclei here that are in the flowing uh, blood of the vein, instead of being outside the slice plane to the right, it's going to think that it's going to be in the slice plane, but displaced out of the vein upward. So sometimes uh, when you see vessels at an oblique angle to the plane, what you'll actually see is the signal intensity from that vessel will be displaced uh, by the readout gradient because of the flow effects. This is just an example. Here we can see there's CSF flow here anterior to the pons that's at an oblique angle. And it's actually because of the, re the a readout gradient is up and down it's actually displacing the signal intensity that should be the CSF into the, the brainstem itself. Uh, so you can occasionally see that. Uh, there are many different ways to do MR angiography, and I am really uh, don't want to go through all of them uh, here today. So why don't we go past that. And what I'd like to try to do then is end up today uh, with... Uh, uh, discussion of hardware. So let's just talk about the, the basic hardware in an MR scanner machine. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a schematic diagram of roughly what the coils look like inside a, a typical modern superconducting magnet. <clears throat> You'll have uh, solenoid coils in the center where you can see the flow of the of the electricity is in uh, one direction. And at the end of the coil, at the end of the magnet, you'll actually have coils uh, that are placed where the, f the flow is in the opposite direction to as shielding co coils. This decreases the amount of peripheral field that the, that the magnetic field extends into the room and allows you to put magnets in smaller rooms and with uh, less magnetic shielding. So it's called, another term for this is a self-shielded magnet. And all the modern uh, superconducting magnets that you buy are, are sh self-shielded. So typically what the door looks like. Uh, <clears throat> let me just ask a question here. Uh, Sheila, what's, this is outside the magnet room. Uh, what do you think is happening here? I don't know if it's helium gas or when they call it quantum. I don't know if it's the helium. Or it's, it starts with a Q. I can't remember now. So this is this is helium that's being boiled off. This is because the magnet quenches. <laughs> uh, so what is quenching? Quenching, I think. Quenching, I think, is when the it's like the magnet magnet um it's it's not a good thing but it's when the magnet i think is like too over if overheats or it's too um i can't remember exactly what happens but i think it's okay uh superconducting magnet a superconductor is a is a substance 
that if you put electricity in it, there's no resistance to the electricity. <coughs> so if you have a, a coil that's a super, they're made out of superconducting material, and you put an electric current in it, it'll basically go around forever and, and never stop because there's no resistance to stop it. And uh, most of the coils we use now are superconducting coils. The uh, how super superconductors were first detected in the in the early uh, night uh, early twentieth century, and uh, the physics as to how a superconductor worked uh, really wasn't figured out until the late fifties, early sixties, and uh, the, uh, the Nobel Prize for that was given in nineteen seventy two as to how it works. The way in practice uh, uh, coils are developed that are superconducting coils is that you basically have a superconducting material that's embedded in copper. Now, and the reason for that is superconducting coils, if it, they are superconducting only below a critical temperature, above a critical temperature, they're very poor conductors. So if you have a huge current, like you would have in, a, say, a three Tesla magnet, it's a huge amount of current. If that uh, wire all of a sudden became, had any even a small amount of resistance within it, it would create the, re, the resistance would create a, a, a very large temperatures, which would melt everything. It would become a huge heater all of a sudden, like an electric heater, and it would melt and destroy the coil. So to try to minimize any injury that might occur when you have a quench, uh, most of the coils are embedded in copper. And then if you start to have a quench, uh, the, the current is uh, shifted automatically from the superconducting material, which now becomes highly resistive material, into the copper, which uh, has resistance, but not nearly as high a resistance as the superconducting material would have uh, once it gets above its critical temperature. But what quenching is, is basically the superconductor is no longer superconducting. Uh, and that's almost always means that it's because the temperature uh, somewhere in the coil has gone above the critical stage. And uh, there's a portion of the superconductor which is no longer superconducting. It's very common if that occurs without, without being controlled properly for it to destroy the magnet, but not always. The current magnets, are, they try to design so that they can survive quenches by shifting the current into uh, the, the, copper the copper wire. However, when it occurs, it's still the copper has resistance and it produces a lot of heat. So now the, the magnet itself becomes a very large electric heater. And it immediately, uh, that heat is transferred to the helium that's cooling the, the, the wires and causes it to, uh, to boil off. And then you typically will have it it should be designed so that if there's any boil off, it's immediately taken through a big pipe to the outside. Because even though it's boiling off, uh, the temperature of that helium gas is extremely cold. It would freeze anything in it. And if you're in the room, it could, uh, it could kill someone immediately by two ways. It can, it can replace the oxygen and asphyxiate someone, or it can markedly drop the temperature in the room, uh, freezing someone. So typically, it's designed so that they, they vent to the outside, and this is what happens when you have a quench. That's the helium going outside, and that's it. It's very cold, so it's producing condensation in the atmosphere once it hits the outside where there's water vapor. So that's a, that's a quench. <clears throat> so this, then, is kind of what the coil looks like. Uh, the shielding coils we just saw here are at either end on the outside to try to decrease the fringe field. The main coils are here. Uh, with correction coils uh, all the way through uh, the center part of the magnet. And the current here flows in one direction. The current in the shielding flo coils flow in the opposite direction to cancel out peripherally. Typically, you have a lot more uh, windings at the periphery to try to uh, get as uniform a field as possible. You, normally, you would have a drop off in the field toward the edges. And therefore, you try to supplement it by additional coils on the edges. The gradient coils are in the center here. And then the receiver coils are the ones closest here uh, to the to the person in the in the magnet. Now, gradient coils. We know that gradient fields are extremely important in producing any sort of images. And typically, what gradient coils are are what's called a Helmholtz pair, or uh, 
in this particular case, what we have is two just circles of coils separated by, by a given distance, and there's an optimum distance. If you have the radius of the coil A, the optimal separation is 1.31 uh, uh, radiuses uh, between the two. You have current flowing in opposite directions, and that will then produce almost a nice linear gradient uh, from one side to the other. Uh, and that's what you can do uh, kind of from the head to the foot in a, in a, a, a cylindrical uh, magnet. But for anterior, posteriorly and to right to left, in a cylindrical magnet, you can't put coils like this because they have to conform to the geometry of the cylinder. And therefore, up and down and sidewise, uh, you put in coils like this, uh, which uh, putting the current in opposite directions can put gradients both up and down and right to left. And then as far as, our, so, so those are the coils that are used to create the main magnetic field and then the, the put current into them to pulse them to get the gradients that we need for imaging. And then we have to receive the signal back at the time of the echo. And there are a number of different coil designs to do this. The simplest are just single loops of uh, wire so there would be a single loop of wire inside this coil, and it's fixed in plastic so that it's rigid and, and doesn't break uh, easily and can be positioned uh, easily by the technologist. That's connected by a coaxial cable, and this coaxial cable then can be uh, uh, put into the preamplifier that can amplify the signal and send it into the computer. And it can have different sizes. Smaller ones give you smaller area that you cover, but higher signal to noise in that small small area. Here's just a planar coil here that's put next to the temporal mandibular joint. Here is the uh, condyle, which we can see uh, right here in the center of the image. Notice that when you have a planar coil, uh, you're very sensitive to signal close to the coil here, but the signal drops off fairly rapidly. So we have a very poor signal to noise to the left of the image, but very high signal to noise to the right of the image. And it's the uh, it, lack of homogeneity within the images, which makes just single coil loops uh, not optimal to work with, though we've had to work with them for many years. But if you want high signal to noise and high resolution, this is just a single coil of wire. That's put. This is a bovine patella. Uh, <clears throat> we've placed the coil, the, 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 the coil right next to the patellar articular cartilage of this cow that was removed. Uh, and this is the articular cartilage. This is the calcified layer of the deep articular cartilage. This is the subchondral bone, and this is the trabecular bone. And from top to bottom here is about a centimeter. So using high gradients and a small coil, even on a 1.5 Tesla scanner from the 1980s, we could get very high resolution images. This is about a little less than 200 micron images where you can actually see the trabecular bone here. And you can certainly see a lot of the articular cartilage of the patella. This is a T1 weighted image on the left. This is a T2 weighted image on the right. And notice we talked how there's more fluid, uh, much higher water content in the periphery of the articular cartilage. And you can see that on this T2 weighted image. Whereas deep here, there's a lot more susceptibility artifact, more calcium that causes signal loss. Also notice how the normal articular cartilage uh, is kind of wavy. It's not perfectly smooth on the surface. Now, the, the next set uh, is called a Helmholtz pair. <clears throat> These are basically two linear coils. And as described above, you can get more uniform signal intensity in the middle if they're spaced at a, at a proper location. And the distance to maximize the uniformity of the signal would be the distance between the two coils would be about 1.3 times the radius of a coil. This is a little bit wider than that. For many years, we would use this for TMJs so we could get both TMJs. In fact, many people still use this as a TMJ coil. <clears throat> Here's just an example of what the Helmholtz looks like. It's somewhat more uniform signal in the middle, but again, you get brighter signal intensity adjacent to the two coils on either side of the, of the head. And you can use flex coils. Uh, my experience with flex coils is they're never quite as good as rigid coils when it comes to signal intensity. <laughs> But especially if you guys go to Tower and some of the other sites when you go there, uh, you can occasionally use flex coils because they are uh, nice to use, especially for unusual body parts. 
is just a flex coil that's wrapped around the, the hip. We can get a little bit more uniform signal intensity, but again, it tends to be bright next to the coil with a lot of drop off when you get uh, away from the coil. <clears throat> Now, there are two fundamental different kinds of coils. One, they're linear versus quadrature. Uh, Michael, do you know the difference between linear and quadrature coils? No, I, no, I don't. No. So, uh, if you... If you, if you look at uh, light like from a re regular incandescent bulb, uh, that produces photons. And if you remember, we talked that photons are polarized. They're, they're circularly polarized. Uh, and they're either right-handed or left-handed photons. And when you have an incandescent light bulb, you get equal numbers of right-handed versus left-handed photons which come out of it. In fact, an electromagnetic wave, if you remember, is a, see my hands are not up, uh, uh, basically are a sine wave of electric field in one direction. At right angle of that is a sine wave of magnetic field. And whenever the electric field goes to zero, the magnetic field perpendicular to it is at a maximum. And then they'll go down and up as a sine wave. And then they'll extend. Uh, uh, they'll extend the direction that the photon is traveling uh, <clears throat> would be perpendicular to the two directions of the electric and magnetic field. But if you start with a maximum field in electric direction, and as you go along, uh, if your thumb is pointing in the direction of the main magnetic field, then if the maximum uh, of the fields uh, uh, con continues to, to, is the maximum goes around uh, uh, in a clockwise direction uh, uh, as looking from, from behind the photon. That's a right-handed photon. If it goes in a counterclockwise direction, it would be a left-handed photon. <clears throat> now, uh, <clears throat> and it turns out if you have a linear coil, if a linear coil then will receive information, it would be just like a straight circular loop of wire that would be sensitive to detecting signals from either right-handed or left-handed photons. If, however, you have two coils that are kind of right angles and you tune them so that they can only be sensitive to one uh, uh, polarization and not the other polarization, then that's called a quadrature coil receiver. And it turns out when you actually do an experiment in the, in the body and you put in RF, <clears throat> that the uh, you get right and left-handed photons from noise, from the noise tissues, but from the actual signal that you put in, uh, it's, it's only polarized in, in one direction. And therefore, if you have a receiver coil that, can on, that uh, <clears throat> will only detect polarization uh, in the direction that the signal is in uh, and not from the opposite, then you can, since, since all of the photons that are polarized in the opposite direction are just noise, you can significantly increase the signal to noise on your images by having a quadrature reception. In fact, it improves it by the square root of two because you're blocking out uh, half of the photons which are all noise. Uh, so, uh, initially, we just dealt with linear coils. Uh, then we started using quadrature coils to get the improvement in the signal to noise. And we get, you've got significant signal to noise improvement with quadrature coils. Uh, here's a quadrature shoulder coil. So remember, a quadrature coil really by definition has to be more complex than just a single wire. You really have to have uh, coils in two opposite directions and that they have to be out of phase with each other by 90 degrees to allow you to actually receive only uh, <clears throat> uh, photons of the proper uh, of the of, of the proper polarization, and these are just uh, images that we got. This is an old extremity quadrature coil of the knee, which substantially improved the signal intensity that we got from the knee. 
Also, when you use quadrature type technology, the uniformity of the signal is much better than if you use just linear technology. And these are, <clears throat> so the first set of coils we had were linear coils. Then uh, in the late 1980s, we were able to substantially improve the signal to noise by going to quadrature coils. Then in the 90s, uh, the concept of the phased array coils was developed, of which there are many now. Uh, <clears throat> and we talked a little bit about this uh, earlier in, in the lectures. Uh, if you remember, if you use a small linear coil, uh, then you get very good signal to noise, but you're dealing with a very small area of anatomy. Uh, typically, when we did back imaging in the past, we would use what were called license plates coils, which were a single uh, loop of coil uh, in a rectangle in the shape of a license plate, which would give us good imaging throughout the lumbar spine. But if we really wanted to see detail, like the L5 to S1 level, if we really wanted to see the pedicles for looking for small pedicle injuries, then we had often rescan the patients putting a small coil, like a five inch uh, round coil, right at the L5 S1 level, and we could often markedly increase the sensitivity for picking up edema within the pedicles when we did that. And then people realized that, well, we could get we could get very high quality imaging of the spine if you could just put small coils up and down the spine or, or just image the L5 le level with one five inch coil, move it, image the, uh, the three, four level and keep moving it up. Uh, it would require doing about five or six scans, but then you could get very high quality scans of the lumbar spine and you could use Photoshop or something and stitch them together and get very high quality images. But immediately people recognized that, uh, well, what if we just put a series of small coils on the, <clears throat> on the spine and acquired all the high resolution images all at the same time? <clears throat> well, the problem, like we talked about before, is that if those coils are all talking to one another, <clears throat> then all of those coils will also receive the noise from the other coils, and you'll end up with the same signal to noise as the single license plate coil. Actually, it would be a little worse than the single license plate coil that we were using before. But uh, very, very smart people realize, however, that if the coils were electrically independent, which means that if you put current in one coil, it does not induce current in the coil next to it. And if you took the signal from each of those, <coughs> and had it amplified by a separate a set of electronics, you could simultaneously acquire images from each of the coils uh, at the same time, <clears throat> but get no crosstalk between them. So then you could get separate images of the spine, all with high resolution and high signal to noise. And then you could, then you could put them together later to have a single large image throughout the spine but then you could all you could do that in the same time it took you <clears throat> to acquire the one images before. And that's what a phased array coils do. There's a series of small coils that are put in a geometric arrangement so that they don't talk to one another and that, so there's no electrical crosstalk. Uh, they're each uh, <clears throat> plugged in to their own electronics so they each produce separate images and then the computer can stitch them together to give you a very rapid, very high resolution, high signal to noise image. So this is just what a phased array coil looks like in the foot and ankle. Notice here, if there's a subtle overlap between the coils, it's this overlap which causes the coils to be electrically independent. So if I put current in this particular coil, it turns out that that will produce a magnetic field that would go around in this direction. <clears throat> the magnetic field going into this coil would induce current in the coil. But what happens is <clears throat> there's a, a, very, a very strong amount of magnetic field right in this particular overlap area, which is, goes in the opposite direction to the weaker field in the larger area. And those two areas in the strength of the magnetic fields are designed so that every time you have current in this wire, the induced current in the coil next to it from the magnetic flux in this area exactly cancels out the induced current from the magnetic flux in the larger area. And, and therefore, they're electrically independent, 
and all the coils and phase array coils are designed that way. <coughs> and then each of these coils is hooked in independently to its own electronics. It creates an image from each of these coils that are stitched together to give the high quality coil, uh, images that, that uh, we typically look at. And most of our imaging in this day and age is done by phased array coils because it's the, much, it's the most efficient way to get the highest resolution images. Here are just some images from a number of years ago from early phased array coils in the ankle on a three Tesla system. And here is a hand system that's also phased array with the, most, with the multiple coils. <clears throat> and uh, this is the knee coil. And then here is a <clears throat> kind of more recent uh, variety of head coil. But you can see here that there are really two separate coils here. One of the red coils, which is the receiver component, and notice they overlap so that they, it makes them electrically independent of one another. And then there's a blue uh, set of coils outside of it. <clears throat> uh, these, these are the transmit coil. The blue transmits the signal. The red receives a signal coming back from the, from the person. And they're, they're separate because th this is designed to give a uniform transmission of RF into the structure. And then the red coils are designed uh, to be uh, a very efficient phased array receiver coils within the knee. And each of them are independent. And uh, this is, I think, an eight channel, which means you have eight independent electronic channels uh, that each of the coils feeds to create an image. And then here's just some examples of some knees done with uh, phased array technology. <clears throat> and then here just the way some of the shoulder coils are done. So does anybody have any questions about any of the hardware associated with MR imaging? <laughs> Sheila? Do you remember how they um, seal the rooms so that the MR scanner, like, um, or like when they use the semi trucks, like what are they putting around the semi trucks? Okay. The, there are two kinds of shielding that are typically used with uh, MR. One is magnetic shielding, which has to be some form of iron, and some are much more efficient than others. So you basically will create an iron cage, put the magnet in it, and then uh, when you fire up the magnet, uh, the all the magnetic flux is contained within the the steel box, the iron box. And you need a lot less iron now than in the past because we have active shielding from the coil that I, that I talked about. So that's one form of shielding. Another form of shielding is RF shielding. And that's basically there is a lot of RF transmissions, radio, TV transmissions that transmit at the frequency that we use for MR imaging. And if you don't shield that, then what will happen is that you'll get RF signals from the outside that the computer will think are coming from the body, and you'll get a lot of artifact on the images. We see some of that with our low field scanners because a uh, number of the low field scanners that we use, the ECOD scanners, don't have very good shielding because they don't shield the room. They try to just shield around the knee because that's a lot, that's a lot cheaper. And a lot of that shielding fails, and that's why sometimes we see a lot more... Uh, uh, noise on the images at some times than we would at other times. And typically, you, for a lot of those scanners, you can see some images are very noisy, and that's when somebody in the room next door turned on a uh, uh, some sort of shredding machine or something. And when they turn that machine off, then the images are good again, and that's because the RF shielding is not very good. For most whole body scanners, the room is, has, is an RF shield called a Faraday shield, and often, if you look at the window that you have, you'll see that there's a, uh, wire meshing in the window. That's all part of the RF shielding of the room. Right? Any other questions? Does anybody else have any questions? No. No? No. Okay. Then why don't we call it a day, and tomorrow we'll start back on uh, medical stuff. Okay. Thank you.